If you suffer from time excusitis, the cure is simple. Mind you, it's not necessarily easy, but it is simple. Here it is. Resolve now never to say, I don't have the time or I'm too busy. Always seek ways to accommodate new challenges in your job or special assignments or extra time with your family. You may find yourself slipping back into the excuse from time to time, but if you do, catch yourself. When you're about to say, I don't have time, change your mind. It often helps to budget your time, just like you might budget your money. Sit down and write out a time plan. Strive to become that busy person that people seek out for special challenges instead of another victim of excusitis. Remember, everyone has the same amount of time. The difference is in how you use it. Look, with my health the way it is, I just do what I can to get by. I'm not about to press my luck and give myself a heart attack. Another prominent form of excusitis is health. This ranges all the way from the chronic, I don't feel good, to the more specific, I've got such and such wrong with me. So-called bad health in a thousand different forms is used as an excuse for failing to do what a person wants to do, failing to accept greater responsibilities, failing to make more money, failing to achieve success. Millions and millions of people suffer from health problems. But is this really a legitimate excuse in most cases? Consider for a moment the other side of the coin. The people who become fabulously successful in spite of health problems and who didn't use health as an excuse. Franklin D. Roosevelt was confined to a wheelchair much of the time by polio, but he still served nearly four terms as president. John F. Kennedy was hampered by severe and sometimes crippling back pain, but he never publicly complained. Itzhak Perlman, one of the world's great violinists, has to walk with the aid of crutches. Arthur Ashe, the tennis champion, had his athletic career tragically foreshortened by heart trouble, but he went on to great success in business. There are scores of successful people in every walk of life who suffer from diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and other so-called debilitating diseases, but they don't use them as excuses. The point is simply that your physical condition doesn't need to hold you back. And for most people, health is simply no excuse for lack of success. Doctors will tell you that the perfect specimen of the human animal simply doesn't exist. There's something physically wrong with everybody. Many people surrender, in whole or in part, to health excusitis. But successful people don't. The more you worry about your health, the worse you are going to feel. Not only that, but the more you tell other people about your bad health problems, the worse you're going to make them feel too. You see, whenever you tell someone, I feel rotten today, or I have a headache, you're really telling them, I'm a little bit dead today. And nobody, but nobody, wants to be around a dead person. The plain truth is, there are only two people in the world who really want to hear you complain about your health problems. One is your doctor, and the other is your mortician. Nobody else cares. Nobody else wants to hear about your bad health. Now look at the other side. When you tell someone, one, I feel great. Look what happens. First, you make yourself feel better. Try it right now and you'll see what I mean. Say out loud, I feel great. Come on now, say it. I feel great. It's impossible to say that and not actually feel better. Second, you make the other person feel better when you tell them how great you feel. And third, you make them feel better toward you. When anyone asks me how I'm feeling, I automatically tell them that I feel so good I can hardly stand it, and if I felt any better, I'd be worried. This makes people laugh, but it also makes me feel better, because how you feel is a product of how you think you feel. So now is the time to cure yourself from the disease of health excusitis forever. Here's how to do it. The vaccine against health excusitis comes in four doses. First, refuse to talk about your health. Talking about your bad health is like putting fertilizer on weeds, and besides that, it bores people. Success-minded people defeat the tendency to complain about their health. Second, refuse to worry about your health. If you have a problem, see your doctor, but don't worry about it. It won't make things any better. It will just make things worse. Third, be genuinely grateful that your health is as good as it is. Remember the old saying, I felt sorry for myself because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. There's always somebody worse off than you are, so be glad for the good health that you do have, and don't dwell on your health problems. Finally, remind yourself that it's better to wear out than to rust out. Life is yours to enjoy.
enjoy 24 hours a day. Don't waste it. Don't pass up living by thinking yourself into a hospital bed. People ask, hey, man, you know, it's, you know, these kids, man, it's rough dealing with them. That's right. That's right. You think peer pressure happened overnight? We went through peer pressure. I remember as a kid, some guys said, hey, Les, me and another fellow named Willie Lower, we were going home. Hey, man, we're going down to Goose, man, and knock off a grocery store. I said, look here, I don't want no part of that. I'll see y'all later. So y'all chicken. I said, that's all right, you say whatever you want. Low stuff. I'm not chicken, man, don't call me chicken. Then why don't you come? We didn't even ask you to come into place, man. All you do, just drive the car, that's all. I don't know how to drive that good. Well, we're trying to get Les to come, he's chicken. Hey, I'm not driving nothing, all right? Willie, don't care about what they say, man. Leave him alone. You want to go do it? You find somebody else to drive, or you drive yourself. Come on, Willie, man, pull him, he stop. I ain't chicken. All I gotta do is drive? Yeah, I said, Willie, that sounds simple, man. Don't go, man. He went. And the next day, we read the newspaper, where when they robbed the store, a robber came, they, when they came out running to a car, the merchant, the man who owned the store, came out just shooting wildly, and he hit the driver in the head. So peer pressure didn't just start in the 90s or the 80s. It's difficult, it is challenging for kids right now. And it's gonna be take um, some easy, simple methods to help bring them out of this madness, this insanity? No. Is it hard? Yes. Let's look at what we've been doing. What has worked? What has not worked? Let's look at where we want to go. What is it that we want to produce? What is it that we want to create for our young people? And as we think about that, start experimenting with different methods and techniques to create and to produce that and begin to believe that it's possible through our commitment, through our vision, through our determination, our relentlessness, because of our belief, it's possible that we can reduce the teenage homicide rate, the teenage pregnancy rate, the dropout rate, that it's possible looking at what kind of world are they going to be in. As we look at the global economy, that as we begin to use our collective will and genius and resources, it's possible that we can create an educational system that not only will test their minds with, with information and facts and figures, but would teach them how to think and be creative. And what does it mean to be a human being and to value human life? And how do you make relationships work? How do you bounce back from adversity? It's possible that we can give them a curriculum that will give their lives a sense of purpose and direction and meaning and teach them how to begin to know and operate on a higher level of being, where they become assets to our society rather than liabilities. What if we leave here with that kind of consciousness that it's possible as opposed to saying we have to write this generation off, that it's possible that we were born for such a time as this and that, that maybe someone here has the idea or the method or some plan of action or an approach that can resolve many of the problems that we're facing with young people today. Whatever we have to do to save our children, it's worth it. Now, we bring more to the next week, we bring more to the next month, we bring more to the next year. If you follow this, absorb, respond, and reflect. I said to my father, when he was about to turn 76, his 76th birthday, I said, dear father of mine, can you imagine what it's gonna be like to gather up the last 75 years of your life and invest them in your 76th year? What a difference of philosophy, rather than just hanging on one more year. Gather up 75 and invest them in the next one. Gather up the last six years and invest it in the next year. See, that's so powerful in communication, which we're gonna study soon, so powerful. So consider this, one, the ability to absorb, second, the ability to respond, third, the ability to reflect. Here's number four, develop the ability to act, take action. Not hasty if it isn't required, but don't lose much time. Here's the time to act. When the idea is hot and the emotion is strong, that's the time to act. You say, Mr. Ron, I'd like to have a library like yours. See, if you feel strong about that, what you gotta do is get the first book and then get the second book. Before the feeling passes and before the idea gets dim, action pronto, action immediate, action as soon as possible. Because if you don't, here's what happens. We call it the law of diminishing intent. We intend to when the idea strikes us. We intend to when the emotion is high. But now if you don't translate that into action fairly soon, now the intent starts to diminish, diminish, diminish. And a month from now, it's cold. A year from now, it can't be found. So act, set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the discipline. Somebody talks about good health and you're stirred. So, right, you need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before, before the emotion gets cold. 
go for the book, start the library, start the process, fall on the floor, do some pushing. Action. Got to take action. Otherwise, the wisdom is wasted. Otherwise, the emotion soon passes. Unless you put it into a disciplined activity, capture it. Disciplines is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity. Discipline. Now, here's what's important about disciplines. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase: Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive in saying, "Well, this doesn't matter." I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. We all pity the man who says, "Well, this is the only place I let down." Not true. Key to take home: Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Every letdown affects the rest. This is part of the educational process on personal development. If you don't take the walk around the block, you probably won't do the apple a day. If you don't do the apple a day, you probably won't consist. You know, start building your library. If you don't build your library, you probably won't keep a journal, and you won't take pictures, and you won't do this. You won't do wise things with your money. Won't do wise things with your time. Won't do wise things with your possibilities and relationships. And the first thing you know, six years of that accumulated, and we say you have. Messed up. So the whole key to reversing that process now is to start picking up these disciplines. Now here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects the rest of your disciplines. Every new one affects the rest. That's why action is so important. The least action, the smallest action. Take it, because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it'll inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to get an apple. Get an apple, it'll inspire you to get a book. Get a book, it'll inspire you to get a journal. Get a journal, it'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new, and you've started a whole new life process. Key. Also, one more thought on discipline. Here's the greatest value of discipline: self-worth, self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to discipline. The least lack of discipline, and it starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit. The, the, the slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough, you say, "Well, it's just going to affect my sales." No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now you've begun in the slightest way to affect your own philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. Neglect starts as an infection, and if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And one neglect leads to another. Worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You say, "Well, how can I get back my self-respect?" I'm telling you, you don't have to go to 29 classes. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that now corresponds to your own philosophy. Like I should, and I could, and I will. No longer will I let neglect stack up on me, so that I will have the sorry scenario six years from now, giving some excuse instead of celebrating my progress. That's the key to this. Okay, let's get kids involved in the least of this. One more, and then one more, and then another one, and then another one, and then some more. And the first thing you know, you're starting to weave the tapestry of a disciplined life into which you can pour more wisdom and more attitude and more strong feeling, more faith and more courage. Now you've got something a vessel in which to put it, and now the equities start to flow. And the early return, I'm telling you, if you'll start this process, the early return will have you so excited you'll commit yourself to this strategy for the rest of your life. You'll never go back to the old way. Join a new crowd. Join a new group. The disciplines to take action. There are people in your life who are just hanging on to you, pulling you down. Negative. Don't believe. They just keep. They like dead weight. You gotta let them people fall off, man. You gotta let these people go, because when you get rid of them, then you can orbit to where God wants you to go. So that's what you have to remember about the journey: that you are going to lose people along the way. The whole time, you're going to lose a lot of people. So I hope that makes sense to you. You know, when I speak, I don't know.、Uh, I don't. I don't use paper. You know, I don't write and then talk. I only come if people will allow me to say what's in my heart. You know, I don't like writing it down. I, I know. I know my life. If you ask me about my life, I don't gotta write that down. I've been living this the whole time, so I speak. I don't want to offend anybody. I speak. I'm kind of loud, you know. See, like the baby. I'm kind of loud, you know. And so that's that's how I talk, the way I talk, because I'm I'm. But I'm passionate. I want young people to get to where God has planned for you. I, I want, and that's why I'm so passionate.
because you you can be great, but you have to make the decision to be great. This is a decision. God gives us the power of choice. You get to decide if you want to work at the bank, if you want to ride a bus, if you want to sail the ocean. You get to make decisions. You've got to make smart decisions for your life. But you have the power. When you include God, you have the power to be anything. You can be great. Or you can be nothing. You have to make the decision. If you like being nothing, it's okay. It's okay. I don't. I don't want to be with you, but you can make the decision. But what you cannot do is allow your friend next to you, who has decided to be nothing, to cause you not to be nothing. That's what you got to be careful of. If your friend don't want to do the things that's necessary, you should stop being his friend. I started out at door to door sales. <laughs> by mistake but i did and it changed my life i admire what you're doing i want you to understand that i know what you're doing i did it for years you can track back a half a billion dollar net worth for me now to knocking on doors when i was a 21 year old kid so those of you guys in this room with a dream to do something great with your life and you're kind of average and ordinary maybe you're not the smartest dude in the world or the biggest dude in the world but you want to do something great with your life maybe i can be an example of that because I know what it's like not to feel great about what you're doing, to doubt whether you're doing this. And I just got to tell you something. I'm an example. This stuff pays off. Okay? So I'm going to take you through some of those keys that I went through. Actually, I started knocking doors kind of by mistake. I got recruited into the financial services business. There's a bunch of these old, stale financial dudes in there. And they kept telling me, hey, our average market, we want married people who own a home who have kids. Middle America for our products, right? And I kept thinking, how come you don't just go where they live. Like, if they have a house and we know the neighborhoods they live in, why don't we just go see these people? Why are we going through calls and all this roundabout easier stuff? Why don't we just knock on their door and say something? Can you guys teach me what to sell? Well, they thought that idea was hilarious. Like, who actually go knock on a door? Like, well, I would, I just wanted to win. I just wanted, how many of you relate to that? You just want to win. I don't care what the hell it took, if it was legal, ethical, and moral, I wanted to win. And so to dick around with me, like, so what's the script? Give me the script. This dude's name was Frank. I won't say his last name because they're all out of business now. But I remember Frank and him laughing. He's like, oh, because we were in the life insurance business. He goes, best thing to say, reverse psychology. Just when you knock on the door, when they open the door, go, you don't want to buy any life insurance, do you? I was stupid enough to think that was the real script. They were dicking around with me at the time. So I went out on that Saturday and knocked on about 200 doors. And everybody that opened the door, this dumbass little kid, me, I'd go, hi. I'm Ed Milet. You don't want to buy any life insurance, do you? And the vast majority of them go, no, bam, and shut the door in my face. But one of them that day, one of them said, matter of fact, I do. We just had some guy here that was trying to rip us off. We are trying to buy some life insurance, but I'm trying to find somebody ethical who can do it. I said, I'm your guy. I literally walked in their house and sold them the insurance that day. But we were in the recruiting business, so a lot of the people that said no to me, I'd say why, and they'd go, I ain't making enough money to buy any life insurance. I'd say, I'm glad you said that. Are you looking for an opportunity to make secondary income? 27 of them said yes. That Tuesday night at our recruiting meeting, I had 27 freaking guests there to hear about getting recruited because I knocked on 200 doors that day. Every, there were only 30 people at the whole meeting, I had 27 of them. And my career started to transform because I was willing to do the things other people weren't willing to do. The other thing I figured out is I was in the math business. Most of you ain't figured this out yet. That's why you're not making what you can make. At the end of the day, you got to get in a bigger hurry. You got to see more people. You got to run larger numbers. You're going to get to the top of your field to recruit more people, sell more people. You got to see more people. The flat matter is this is a competitive sport you're in. It may not feel like a sport. It's a sport. And for those of you that do more reps, win. More contacts, win. See more people, win. Y'all with me on that? Say yes. Yes. Yeah. See, you probably thought I was going to give you some like fluffy, I don't know nothing about selling speech. You got to run larger numbers, man. Hey, sister, you aren't running big enough numbers. You want to get to the big time? You want to get to the top of what you're doing? You got to run more numbers, see more people, recruit more people, and sell more people. Okay? That's the bottom line. You don't start to see more people, I'm going to smoke you. If I knock 200 a day and you knock 50, if I see 500 and you see five, I don't care how good you think your script is, how great you are, how persuasive you are, you take a dude like me, I will smoke you.
It's possible you can get what you want. It's necessary. If you want it, you got to go into action. You got to be willing to experiment. You got to be willing to fail and to succeed. You got to be willing to form and to develop new relationships. It's you. It's on you. You got to make that happen. Nobody's going to bring it to you on a silver platter and say, here's your dream manifested. No, it's hard. Yes, it's hard. It's difficult. Yes, right. And it's worth it. Live frustrated thinking that there's something wrong with you, trying to prove to them who you are, trying to convince them to affirm you. Let it go. There's nothing wrong with you. If you had to have it, they would give it. Since you don't, shake it off. Keep your head held high. Your value doesn't come from people, it comes from your Creator. Either you take on the shape of your environment or you resist it and transform by the renewing of your mind. Everything you've ever changed about your life started in your head. 
It started in your head. It started in your mind. It started with a decision. It all starts in your mind. What we think is the best many times is far less than what God has in mind. You haven't seen your best days. You may feel stuck. Doors have closed. That all happened for a reason. The best part of your life is not behind you. The best part of your life is the next part of your life. You wouldn't be discouraged over that door that closed if you knew what God was about to open. You haven't seen or imagined what God has in store. Many people give up on the one yard line. See, life is not just that simple. It's not that cut and dry. And that's why most people never realize their personal greatness, because they're casual about life. And when you are casual about life, you will end up a casualty. You can't get out of something, something that you're not willing to put into it. You have to put your everything, your mind, your energy, your effort, your discipline. Nothing is going to jump out the fire if you don't throw something in there. It's not going to happen. It's a commitment. It's not a feeling. You do it because you're supposed to. Try your best to trust God. Trust God's timing. And when he is sending you bold signs and wonders, use those as confirmation. When God is trying to steer you in a particular direction, it's like little pieces of popcorn down a hallway. And at some point, you're going to get to that whole bucket. Love yourself. Make caring for you the highest priority in your life. Look out for what truly satisfies you. We're not taught to look out for ourselves. We're not taught to take care of ourselves, to become sensitive to our wants, our desires. So make a conscious effort. Make you number one priority. Your health is more important than your family and any and everybody. Because if you don't have your health, you can't serve anybody. Don't neglect yourself. Greatness takes tremendous focus. It takes decisions that you make. And you can't always have everybody approving of what you know you're supposed to do. And the sooner you understand that, the sooner you'll do great in life. You cannot have the approval of everyone and be great. You're always going to live your life at the lowest common denominator of your friends if you don't watch it. When you receive the message, when you receive the confirmations that these people that are around you are sucking you dry, so how could you have any love left inside of your heart to take care of your kids or your family? When you got these people around you that are sucking you dry. Ah, I got nothing left. I'm going down. I'm melting. I'm melting. So feeling safe and feeling secure is very important to me. And I think it's very important to every single person. I think that God created us to feel safe, secure, confident, and bold. Your soul maybe has it blocked, but God did not create you for fear and worry and insecurity and a lack of confidence and extreme shyness and extreme timidity. You will become whatever you cultivate, whatever you feed, that's what's going to grow in your life. I'm saved, but I got to change my diet. I'm saved, but I got to change who influences me, who speaks into my life, who feeds my mind, who determines what looks good on me, who determines what I can do and who I am. What's wrong with you is all those people who knew you win, because if they knew you win, they'll hold you to back then. I got to go. Too many people looking for identity and value and they're looking for it in all the wrong places. They look for it in what they do, who they know, what they own, what they look like. And I think that we need to do our best to look as good as we can. All I can say is take what God's given you and do the best you can with it. But don't be comparing yourself with somebody else. I become confident when I get the right view of other people and I get the right view of myself. It's amazing, right? You ever notice that arrogance requires advertising? But confidence speaks for itself. In fact, insecurity, cynicism, and arrogance, they're all loud. 
But confidence doesn't even have to speak because confidence isn't based on your words. Confidence is an action. It's an ability to step into the moment and say, I'm not backing down. I'm not quitting. I got my confidence back and I can fulfill. Your tongue is the rudder for your life. It's determining the direction. Next time you're tempted to say something negative about yourself, your future, your finances, zip it up. Don't steer yourself toward defeat. Say not you're too young. Say not you can't accomplish your dreams. God wouldn't have given them to you if you weren't well able. Why are you living a life to impress them? Why are you placing value on what they think? Doing all these things to impress them, why? I'll tell you something right now, man. You need to place value on the people who love you at your worst. Because those are the people who deserve to be there when you're at your best. If you don't heal from emotional wounds, you will bleed on people that had nothing to do with it. How many people are living wounded over how they were raised? A friend that walked away? Instead of letting it go, they replay it in their mind. They wonder why they don't have good relationships. It's because they haven't healed. They're living out of a wounded place. Isn't it amazing how one bad relationship can ruin all of your other relationships? For really being honest tonight, most of the pain in our life, it comes from relationship pain. Some of the hardest things for us to get over, they're attached to people. Despise not the day of small beginnings. And so many people say, when I get a big break, when a big door opens, when somebody notices me, but that is not the key to success. The key to success is to start where you are, right where you are, not when things get better, but start where you are. The only thing worse than one who is inconsistent in applying their self-imposed disciplines is one who has never considered the need or the value of discipline at all. Changing loyalties and shifting frequently from one commitment to another. Leaving behind a trail of broken friendships and unfulfilled promises. All because of a discipline that was either non-existent or imposed so infrequently that it was ineffective. Most of us we're worried about suffering. We're afraid of it. it. When we're suffering and sacrificing, we wonder whether it's worth it. We wonder whether sacrifice or setbacks or suffering is a sign it's not our real dream. See, at the gym, you never think, oh, I'm going through some pain and discomfort. This must be a sign I shouldn't be at the gym. You'd never think that. You have to break it down, suffer and sacrifice for it to grow. When you need motivation yourself, don't look for someone to scream and yell. Don't look for someone else to give you motivation look at yourself and remind yourself why you are doing what you are doing this temporary pain this fight this is what will make you stronger that's the key word discipline self-discipline consistent self-discipline it doesn't really matter how smart you are or how much you know if you don't use it. Better than knowledge is applied knowledge. And once we've applied our knowledge, we must study the results of that process. Get the clutter out. Start letting some of this junk go to make some room for something else. Do that with people. There's some people who's cluttering up your life. They're just holding and occupying the space that somebody useful, positive could be holding that space. You don't even have time to look to see what else is out there because you all have all of these people surrounding you that's not in enabling you to grow. Some of you tonight, you've experienced someone failing you. Maybe your mom was never there. Maybe it was a boyfriend who promised you the world but took off. Before you know it, what happens is these failures are holding us back from getting into our future. And these bad relationships are blinding us from all of the good potential relationships. Success is all about building relationships. It's not what you know, it's who you know. 
Some people might not step up when you ask them for help. But guess what? The worst thing can happen to you if somebody refuses you. You didn't have it anyway. Ask people. You never know. Suppose they say yes. That could be the turning factor. You will travel in the direction of your thinking. If you think down, you will go down. If you think up, you will come up. The way you think about your situation determines your reality. The way you think about your family determines your reality. The way you think about yourself. You're not being hurt by the way people think about you. Many of those people are a reflection of how you think about you. If you think about yourself a certain way, you will attract people who think about you a certain way. And you will expel from your life people who do not line up with how you think about yourself. The mind then becomes the battleground. The mind, Satan is always trying to do battle to take over your mind with warfare. Some of you is fighting your thoughts right now. I want to begin the process of deserving. What would that be? What process should I begin engaging in to deserve good health, to deserve a good relationship? What must I do to begin the process of deserving? There's enough people that are telling us we can't do it, that we're not good enough. Why do we want to tell ourselves that? We know for a fact that thoughts influence actions. We need to get our own self-affirmations. There need to be quiet moments in your bedroom, quiet moments when you're brushing your teeth, that we need to reaffirm, I am the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. If you don't know who you are, you'll discount yourself. Think, oh man, I'm ordinary. Nothing much to offer, nothing special about me. Now life will try to make you feel like you're anything but amazing. Disappointments, betrayals, rejection will try to steal your sense of value. But all through the day, despite what thoughts are telling you, despite who left you out, you need to remind yourself, I am amazing. I have been wonderfully made. Don't go around feeling ordinary when in fact you're extraordinary. People may try to make you feel average. You don't have much to offer. Are you going to believe what people say about you or believe what God says about you? You're amazing. Have you ever said that to yourself? It has to start on the inside. If people can understand that as long as they don't forgive, they're poisoning themselves. It's like me being mad at somebody who hurt me that's out having a good time and don't even care that I'm mad, that doesn't hurt them. It's pointless. It's like, okay, you hurt me, but now if I'm going to hate you, then I'm letting you continue to hurt me. And you're controlling my life, and I'm not going to do that. It is your values. It is your ethics. It is how you make choices that gets you promoted. It is not your strength. It is not your talent. It is not how you fight. It is not how you draw. It is not your intellectualism. It is your values. So that when you are backed up against the water and you have to make a decision, true leadership is how you make decisions in the moment. What do you care the most about? Being seen or being connected? Doors of opportunity are open to those who continually knock. So we don't find open doors of opportunity because we need them. We find them because we deserve them. Only those who knock deserve to find an open door. It says, if you search, you will find. Finding is reserved for the searchers because they deserve it. Now, at first they may have needed it, but they now know that just needing it is not sufficient. The reason why you're going to be blessed with good ideas is because you've come searching. And for those who search, they will find answers. To find a good idea, you must go looking if you wish to find. Rarely does a good idea interrupt you. So we get not what we need, but we get what we deserve. It says if you ask, someone has an answer. If you keep asking, the answers belong to you. So we don't get what we need, we get what we deserve. Living in mourning is going to keep the new doors from opening. You have to heal so you can see the new relationships, the new opportunities. And the quicker you let things go, the easier it is. Your time is valuable. That's a distraction trying to get you off course. 
this is a verse you must remember all your life it says man's days are determined that means you don't decide how long you live your life is on a timer extreme environments will turn you into a different creature extreme environments will make you move differently it can happen in the midst of a dark depression even in the middle of a gut-wrenching heartbreak in the midst of unimaginable loss it can happen my question to you is what's about to change inside of you that's going to make people think you can defy gravity it takes discipline to plan it takes discipline to execute our plan and it takes discipline to change either our plan or our method of executing that plan if the results are poor it takes discipline to ponder the value of someone else's opinion when our pride and our arrogance leads us to believe that we are the only ones with the answers what are your expectations what do you expect to get from life? What do you expect to get from your relationships? What is your ideal day? What is it that you expect from this journey that you're involved in? People that have a strong sense of self-approval, they have high expectations for themselves and from others. I must be great. I'm pretty. I must be great. I have this validation that comes from stuff is never God. I'm really rubbing the grain. Y'all with me? Are you still with me? You can't wear a watch until who made it. You step on the runway. What are you wearing? You got everybody's name on you but your own. So no one is better or less when it comes to time and change. You become what you are by how you use your 24. You have no idea how strong you are. You're not in this thing, life, by yourself. But one of the things that I know about this thing called life, recognize what had happened, the role that I played in it, I had to keep it moving. Gotta keep it moving. Each of us must live off the fruit of his thoughts in the future, because what you think today and tomorrow, next month and next year, will mold your life and determine your future. You're guided by your mind you have built in greatness you have built in power to handle whatever life throws at you and life is going to be throwing a lot of stuff nobody's going to be spared that's why Viktor Frankl called it unavoidable suffering but suffering is a choice because you can suffer or you can choose to do whatever you need to do to overcome whatever you are stuck in right now Never underestimate the power of influence and associations. And never underestimate the power of your own consistent self-discipline. Sleep late, show up late. Waiting is always easier than acting. Imagine what life would be like if we didn't have to make our bed in the morning. Wouldn't it be fascinating if we didn't have to do these things? What do you suppose would become of us? You're right, not much. One of the great distractions of chasing our dreams is this thing that goes off in our head as we're negotiating the price we're paying. Is it getting too high? Is it too much? And you'll have people in your ear, it's too big a sacrifice. You're going through too much. It distracts all your focus. You can't be executing and negotiating simultaneously. So negotiate it now. Negotiate it with me now. What are you willing to pay? For me, when I'm after something big, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, I'll sacrifice everything else. Greatness is not income. On the other hand, poverty is equated in, to greatness in a lot of people, that, that if they have nothing, they must be great. And neither one is true. You're not great because you're poor. You're not great because you're rich. Your greatness is not based upon your income. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. It's the realization that your limitations are self-imposed and that the opportunities for you today are enormous beyond belief to use all your courage to force yourself to think positively on your own problem to let your marvelous mind think about your goal from all possible angles there's some stuff you need to clean out and clear out in your life some activities some relationships some things 
some events, some wrong thoughts, some misconceptions, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual rubble in your life that you need to clear out. What's the rubble in your life? It's the stuff that keeps tripping you up.